professor in um, education, and I actually teach a pre um, or undergraduate course in assessment, um, curriculum and assessment, actually. Um, we talk about the ins and outs of how assessments are designed, the difference between a classroom assessment to assess for content knowledge, um, formative assessments, testing along the way to see what people know, and then finally, some type of formal assessment. Then we also talk about standardized assessments. I'm sure you all are very aware of what standardized assessments are. If you've taken ACT, SAT, any of those that are norm reference, which means they're comparing you to other individuals versus criterion reference where you're comparing yourself to yourself and your own growth. Um, assessment wise, we should be doing more criterion referencing, like showing our own growth, pre-test, post-test type stuff. Our society, as well as the rest of the world, just thinks we should compare one another to each other. I did a little bit of research on how GREs work and the entrance into graduate schools based on GREs. Um, males tend to do better at, the GR, at, the, at taking the GRE assessment. It can be a little bit biased towards math, which typically, I hate to say it, boys are usually better at math and girls are better at English language arts. No matter how many glass ceilings we try to break, those are just statistics in general. Um, not making a blanket, blanket statement. So therefore, if we know that boys are better at taking a GRE, there tends to be more men in um, grad school. And I say boys because I teach people who are gonna be elementary teachers, so I say boys and girls. But um, what we know is that more guys get into grad school. But there's also more men applying, so we really can't make that connection. Um, if you think about how the world works, there's um, there used to be a trend where there was women, more and more women going to um, grad school and then that kind of blew away and now there's more it seems like there's more and more guys who can and it's it's actually trendy to stay home with your kids and be a stay-at-home mom now so you see less women actually entering grad school um, I entered grad school and I got my master's at KU and I didn't have to take the GRE to enter I already had some graduate credit that transferred from Fort Hayes I was actually teaching the area and probably had nine transfer hours um, from the graduate school here I transferred those hours to KU and then I finished my master's there and my PhD at KU. Upon starting my PhD, I did have to take the GRE exam. Um, and I'll get into a little bit of the things as far as my knowledge base and things that I did that I wouldn't do if I were you. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about why people are taking this exam, um, what it's about. Um, the biggest thing you know when you're, um, when you're asking somebody to learn something is the why. People wanna know why do I need to know this? So why do we need to take the GRE? These are things we're gonna kinda explore. So if you want to, and I'll read this to you and then I'll read back to you. I didn't know that the projection isn't going to be quite that great and the Zoom isn't helping. So um, first question is give one example why someone might take the GRE. If you want to text that in, we'll look to see what people say. The first one is to enter grad school. And this could be you or it could just be a general statement. Why would someone take the GRE? Because they like to take assessments and pay $195 to potentially fail. I doubt it. I doubt that. Not that anybody's failing, but why might someone take the GRE? That's very positive to prove that you can do it. If you like taking tests, that's a good one. Okay, just like I said, enter to grad school, possibly doctoral school. Some places make you take the GRE prior to entering a master's program. Other places, um, depending on the college and the subject matter, you don't need to take the GRE until you would want to enter a PhD program. Uh, leveling the comparison between students, it's very good. Because that would be, again, norm referencing, checking your, um, your learning modality against others, comparison against one another. We're gonna assume we're done. If you didn't chime in, you still have more opportunities because I have lots more polls. Um, this one is, real quickly, uh, what do exams like the GRE tell us or hope to predict, theoretically? What does the GRE hope to predict? Why do you have to take this? Like, for the deal? Like, why couldn't you just go to an interview? Show them your GPA for your undergrad. Show them you're involved, that you volunteered a bunch, that you're this awesome person who deserves to go to grad school.
programs today that you know the ones that you're writing school and whatnot. Okay. But then the other ones you can try and get a GA position all over the department and see if it's a people. It's a way to weed people out yeah. numerically, mm -hmm. quantitatively. Uh, the research says <clears throat> theoretically this should predict the GRE should predict your um, success rate in grad school. The problem is there's very little link to that causation. I did a bunch of research on this before coming and I'm like, oh, I wanna know because I don't think that's true. And what they found is it's not uh, that true. In fact, some students who were enter who entered into graduate exams like the GRE um, and were successful their first year weren't successful their second year. It's that stick with itness that you can't assess in a test. It's the grit that d that test doesn't assess. It tests your grit for how well you can study, conduct yourself, be on track, the same things you were talking about. But what it says is that, that they use this as a measure to predict how well you're going to do. Well, this is saying quantitative numbers always prove your intelligence, which if you believe in multiple intelligence, this number is just like an IQ, could be like an EQ. Do you have emotional intelligence? Do <coughs> you believe in that? Then that score could predict your um, ability to do successful, to be successful. So um, they take multiple things when they do take your entrance into or take your application into effect. That's one thing that's a little bit of a help. Um, if you are entering a master's program, depending on where you're going, the GRE may be a big deal. They may just take your GPA, um, a, you know, basically your VITA for your undergrad, and then say, okay, this, this looks like a great candidate. It may not even be until you enter into a PhD program that they even actually ask you to take the GRE. Um, if you're gonna go into dental school and do the, uh, the DAT or the GMAT for other things, those are, these are the same types of exams. We're just talking about different content. But really the construction of these exams is the same thing, the same theoretical underpinnings are how do we approach these exams? How are we gonna be successful at getting through these? There's a multitude of tips out there, but they're probably tips that aren't new to you, but when you get in high stress situations, you often forget them, and then you freak out, and then you're like, oh, I'm gonna be taking that section over again, okay? So that's what I wanted to help you with a little bit today. A little bit of background. Um, what we know about good test takers, just in theory, is people that are good test takers are prepared for the content of the test as well as they have good test taking skills. So this isn't like fundamentally huge, but what I have learned is that there's little tips and tricks that some people don't know. Um, and it's just nice to have those in your background or repertoire as you move forward. So that's kind of what I wanted to help you with today. I think nine tenths of this is really going with the unknown, with the known, and then dealing with the unknown. So our known factors in this are you're you're going to have three sections. So that was one of the questions I asked you um, on the poll anywhere was how many sections are there? There's actually multiple sections within this, but there's three overarching ideas. There's your verbal, the quantitative, and the analytical. Um, the one thing you should know about the verbal and quantitative, those are one-to-one -one points, and they range between 130 and 170 on the scale for um, the range of scores that you could have. They're one point each, so if you don't answer, you don't miss a point, you actually just don't get that point. So you always want to try to answer, even if you fear you're going to answer the wrong question, it's, it doesn't hurt you to go ahead and answer that question. So the verbal are two 30-minute sections. Um, the quantitative, again, there's the two 35-minute sections. Um, those are covering your basic algebraic and, and geometry and a little bit of analytical skills um, in with that, and then you actually have an analytical skills section. Um, on average, it takes about um, four hours, and that gets into this idea of how do you prep for the situation, because four hours is a long time to test or assess your skills. So the first two, verbal and quantitative, if you're a numerically driven person, those are one-to-one -one points. That means every time you answer, it's one point. There's nothing that's worth more. Every question's worth one point, and the scale or the range is 130 to 170 in both of those areas. The only place that's different is this area in analytical skills. I actually um, think I had opened this. And I put a, if you want me to share this document with me, with you, I can definitely do that. I just have a bunch of hyperlinks inside that go to GRE and, a, and some other things. But so this kind of tells you the verbal reasonings, uh, like I said, the scale 130 to 170, one point increments. So you don't lose by answering. You should just answer. Even if you fear at the end, you have to go back and just choose C, quintessential C. Um, obviously a last ditch effort on that. But the quantitative reasoning again is the same. And then analytical is actually <coughs> half point increments. And so it goes up to six so you can get um, if, if you're going to do an A, B, C type scale, a 5.5 to a 6, 
and then you have a 5 to a 5.5 and you keep moving down. Okay, and so those are graded um, through rater, inner rater reliability, so there's multiple raters grading your written, and then they come up with the consensus. So if we're gonna use three people, your trained graders for this analytical section, you each come up and you have five, five, five point five, you just take the average of those and you would have, you know, somewhere between five and five point five. Okay, that's how those are scored through inner rater re reliability. Okay, multiple people scoring that know what they're doing or they're trained, okay? So I just linked to any of this, and again, if you want any of these resources, they're just quick references. Um, about four hours, and the cost is that illustrious $195. Once you've taken it, um, you can't break out. Like, there's a lot of assessments that, you're, that you take to enter into different, in different um, schools, like, for instance, um, ACT, SAT, those are ones you can't break out, but there's some of those you can break out and just take the math section, the reading section, those types of, the writing section. This is one that's grouped together. Um, interestingly enough, when I was doing a little bit of research and we were talking about the reliability and validity of these assessments, they don't place a lot of weight on these if you're not, if you're a non-traditional student, which I thought was interesting. So if you're a person who's 30, 40 years old and you decide, hey, I wanna get my PhD, um, and you haven't been in the classroom doing doing math, doing the basic skills that, that are gonna basically give you the content knowledge you need to pass this test, they actually don't weigh those as heavy, which I thought those, it, it makes sense, but I thought it was interesting. I'm like, so if you're 40, you have a better chance of getting in than if you're 20. It doesn't make, I mean, it's not it's not a good thing to go by, but it makes sense as far as, far as how they do it. They have a lot of, um, you know, firsthand knowledge and things. That's why I'm all about the qualitative part, the interview, those types of things, um, you can learn a lot about a person through a personal interview too. So, things to bring with you, this is like lockdown, this is like a full body scan, if you've taken any standardized assessments recently, has anybody taken any type of standardized assessment? When's the last time you, any, the last time you took an assessment was the ACT or SAT? Okay, what have you taken? GRE. The GRE, yeah. What have you taken? Okay, those, it, when you go to a testing center, it's like literally full body scan. It's crazy. It's like going to the U.S. Embassy in a foreign country, which I've done. Um, <laughs> it is major lockdown. So don't take anything with you. Don't take a calculator. Don't take anything. They literally provide everything. They don't want you bringing anything in just because it's changed so much. Somebody was saying they were in a testing center and they even like zoom your body just to make sure you're not bringing anything in. I'm like, wow, it is like airport security. So again, this is just the basic stuff. This isn't anything you can't find on the ETS website. It's all right there, but it talks about I don't know how you are as a test taker, but I tend to have, and I've had since middle school, a test anxiety. I was the kind of child that would answer every question in biology, and then the test would come around, and I would be and the, the teacher was like, what is going on with you? You qualify for SPARK, but you can't pass, a math, you can't pass these science exams. What's going on? Um, and it ended up that I ended up having some type of anxiety. And I found out that when I know what's happening, going to happen and I know what to expect, it reduces my anxiety by a little. Um, sometimes in a lot, in a lot of cases. So in this case, the one thing I know about myself is it helps for me to know what the exact format is, what to expect, how long I'm going to be there. And the funny thing is if you start reading into the psychology of the GRE, the first thing they'll tell you, the last thing they tell you, and the middle thing they tell you is the more practices you have, the better your success rate will be. The more time you simulate that experience, four hours is a long time to take an assessment. And you're talking about three different types of um, assessment areas. So they're just saying the more practice you do, the better. If you go to GRE, there is a download. It allows you to look at um, two practice exams. They only give you two. Some places you can pay for them. I'm a huge proponent of apps. Like I love to do like the vocabulary app on my phone, especially if you're just sitting there like, oh, what can I do? You could learn like 10 new words today. I mean, come on, there's what, 3,500 potentially on the GRE? Then you'll only be tested on 50. Percentage-wise, yeah. Yes? Is there actually like, such a thing as a word bank for the GRE? There is a word bank. It contains 3,500 words, and you'll only be assessed on 50. What do you want? Um, so it's actually an app that I linked on here, and it's the top-rated app. Um, it's like five stars on um, iTunes, and so I did a bunch of research on that site and look to see what people said about it. And they actually were like, this was very helpful. Um, as we know, um, by, by the age of about three, we um, can identify auditorily about 10,000 words, but we only use about 300 when we're little. And that grows, of course, but 
our, our bank is there, we just don't use it, so it's not being brought up from the back of the filing cabinet very often. So things like the app can keep it fresh in our minds. Yes, did you I, use? Yeah, um, what's the, yeah, how do we access the website or the app? Oh, I'll show you. I okay. have it linked up here. And it may be different than yours or similar, but I'll show you definitely. Okay. Yeah, I'll share that with you because I'm a big app person, especially when you're in the minutia of everyday life. Sometimes a quick app, when you just want to click away, it's, um, especially vocabulary was big for me. Um, okay, so again, when you sign up for ETS, when you go to ETS and you register for your GRE, you're going to get that little thing in the mail. Make sure you take it. It's like your ticket to get on the plane. This is very much an analogy of going on a flight. Um, and you're going to be potentially scanned. Just, I just think it's very odd, so just prepare yourself. Take the minimal, take your ID. Um, they provide everything you, they, it's an on-screen calculator, everything. So again, leave everything at home. Um, they provide a locker for you, and there is a small break in the middle, so if you need a bottle of water or something. Um, and then tips for actually taking um, the actual exam. These were just basic things that I thought were super helpful. One of the things that, that you used to not be able to do when you took the GRE is once you took, once you had a question you couldn't advance beyond it, you had to answer it, but they allowed more time. When you took the paper and pencil one, I think on the paper exam, there were um, like six, six questions per page. The, the actual computer one's a little bit different. It's like five questions per page. They changed a little bit of the formatting. Um, interestingly enough, the thing that we know about research as far as test taking and learning styles and um, skills that we acquire is if you take this book and you study just out of this book and this is all you do and you never take an online assessment i.e. the free things that they allow you to take or you even pay for a couple online free assessments the learning that happens here is different than the learning that's transmitted when you take an electronic assessment so if you're the type of person who's like oh i'm better at paper pencil tests versus this electronic I have a lot of students that say that, which surprises me for people that are 21st century learners. They'd rather take a paper pencil test. Um, if you study in this methodology and you go take a computer test, I can guarantee you it's you're not going to be as successful because the modality in which you're studying here is not the modality in which you take the exam. Start with this, this is good basic knowledge, etc. but when you get ready to take the actual exam and the practice exams, I took them out of here, and then when I got there that day, I was like, oh, Lord, this is like brain boggling. It's just, it was just crazy. It's just crazy how your brain works like that. Um, it's like um, some people who can highlight and study, and that's good enough, and other people have to write out note cards or write it two or three times or hear it. We're all different learners, sometimes a mesh of those learners, auditory, kinesthetic, etc. So the more modalities you can use, great, but you have to take these practice exams in the electronic format just to get your brain used to that. Another thing that um, they really impressed upon multiple places I read is take those exams <coughs> just like you're going to take them that day in a quiet room. Sit down and time yourself for the amount of time that it takes. Prepare doing this and simulating the experience. It'll also make you feel more comfortable, but you also know how exactly, exactly what to expect. And a lot of that psychology of doing that is how you end up being successful. It's not so much the content knowledge, it's just the actual art of taking tests. And I truly believe that's probably the, the, the most true thing I know about really great test takers. And they tend to be very intelligent people too, but knowing how to do it is, a, is really, really important. So answering the GRE, most of it is multiple choice. The majority of it is multiple choice. One of the things I remember is when I did use this as a tool before I started looking at electronic measures was when I did this and then I would do the practice assessment and I would go back most of the questions I missed weren't because the answer I chose was correct. It's because I didn't fully read the question. And some of the questions are yes, multiple choice, but you can choose the most that apply. So it may be A and B, not just A. And if you only choose A, they can't give you 50% because those are one point basis. So you, lose, you missed your point right there. So the biggest thing I was reading about ins and outs of this as well was to make sure you're reading the multiple choice thoroughly and when you do take these practice exams, look to use that data and feedback of, oh my gosh, I missed 8, 11, and 23. Why did I miss those? Assess why you did. It's probably not the content that you don't know, it's the mechanics of how you answered the question, i.e., you didn't read the whole thing, and it, sh it said choose the best or choose the most, and you just chose one when it was probably two answers, um, which is 
really kind of scary because it's trickery. I think it's trickery. So the majority of these are multiple choice questions, okay? One of the things they ask you to do is um, rule out the, the choices that are, are the most obvious. Um, sometimes that is very easy. Sometimes you can be like, yeah, B and D do not make sense it's between A and B. If you fundamentally don't know, one of the things they say is to come back to it. That's the beauty of electronic testing, um, is that it will give you a panel. And that's another thing, is familiarize yourself with how this assessment looks. So when it pops up, you're not going, how do I navigate this? You don't have anything to worry about. And it's super easy to navigate. If you can basically hit an answer and hit the right hand button up in the corner, you can navigate. But when you do get to the end of a section, it pops up and it shows you how many you've entered into, how many you wanted to come back to, and how many you didn't answer at all. So it gives you three categories per question, and then you can go back to those. One of the things they say people lose time on is you sit and ponder, and you doubt yourself, and it becomes the psychology of test taking again instead of what do you really know. And you try to psych yourself out, and you're like, I know this, I know this, I know this, oh my god, I'm stressed. It's not the content you're stressed about, it's the actual situation you've put yourself into. So again, the minute you realize, hey, I really don't know, it looks like it could be A and B, just move on. And that's really difficult. Like, I'm not a person who wants to leave things undotted, uncrossed. I'm so afraid I'll forget. You know, it's probably from taking paper and pencil exams in school and forgetting the whole backside and getting a 50% or something lame. But um, again, come back to it. Move immediately past that. Go through what you do know. Then go back and tackle what you don't know. And start using a little bit of arbitration between what looks good, what doesn't look so good. Another thing is if you look at the stem, <coughs> the actual question, Sometimes there's clues inside of that that help you answer your question. So make sure, again, it's not the content that you probably don't know. It's the mechanics of how you're reading it. Are you taking time to read it? Um, do you have a problem with assessment questions that ask you multiple things? Again, those are things to really cue in on. Um, again, it's usually the mechanics, not the content that you don't know. Practicing. This is something I read over and over. I've been researching this for about a week to kind of think about what was it like to take this and what should I have probably known when I was sitting in your seat and it was taking those practice exams. It said it everywhere, it said it frequently, um, and it said it behooves you to simulate that experience and actually practice, which uh, just sitting for four hours taking this does not sound like fun, but there's reasons to do this because if you only have to do it once, then it's done. Just it's done and it's over with. Um, guessing on an answer is better than not answering at all. Because if you don't answer, you still get a zero. If you guessed it and you got it right, then you still have a point. But if you guessed it and you got it wrong, it was, it was the same no matter what you chose. It's still going to be wrong. Okay? So it says, regardless, there's no harm in guessing. And that was what I would use for the end when you literally have to go back and you're like, hey, I got five minutes left and I still have five questions or six questions to do. And you're at the very end. Go in and use some of those reasoning skills. And when it simply isn't making sense, you may have to do some guessing because you're just not going to remember everything. Yes? When I looked at this morning, it seemed like they don't really bias you out for guessing. But for instance, if you had not guessed, you got 74 questions right. Mm -hmm. uh, versus if you had guessed, you would score a little bit lower, like a point or two. Uh, um, I think what they're trying to do is probably set people apart when yeah. they the final score. Yeah, and that's probably true. There's probably some type of ratio there that determines whether you guessed or not. But at that point, I don't really know electronically how they would. It seemed complicated. I looked at it for yeah. a second. I was like, whatever. It doesn't seem that important. No. Yeah. And I think that's true. A lot of those, a lot of standardized tests do penalize you for guessing. From what I've read on this one, it says the long answer counts the same as no answer, so there's no harm in guessing. You might as well take a shot and get it right. This came right from BTS. Um, so what they're saying is, even if you guess and it's C, then you got it right. But if it was C and it was wrong and you didn't answer, it's still wrong because you didn't put anything in. You still get a zero. It still counts. As, it's a binary deal. It's either zero or one. So they they look at it like that. But I see what you mean is over on this on the overall scale between 130 and 170. Yeah, that, that, that would make yep. sense too, that, Yeah, that makes that makes sense statistically. Because um, when you first started, you said it's, it's a standardized test, so they have to compare you with people who you're taking. Yeah. So I'm guessing maybe like if I got 74 questions right and I guessed a lot, someone else who got 74 questions right and didn't guess um, and missed questions, then they might give him a point better just to separate the two. Yeah, there's probably some statistical factor in there that's going to have, you know, randomly put people back in where they should go with some type of random order. Um, I don't know if you know this or not, but like they say they give you the score at the end of it. Mm -hmm. so you only get those first two scores. You don't get the last score, the analytical writing right. portion. Yeah. That comes but later. Could, could, the, could your score change after 
your final report come out? No, 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 no. Once they, once you hit that button and it shoots out, that is your score. There's nothing that's going to computer the computer portion. The written portion comes out later, and so and that's graded, like I said, by raters that are trained graders in what, in any of these types of assessment. I did a um, a grading um, for, gosh, um, it was, it's a formative assessment um, for one of our, for teaching practice. They do a practicum, a full unit assessment. It's graded through the state, and then you can become graded, you know, graders essentially, and learn the ins and outs of how it works. And it's very much like analytical writing. If you and I graded, um, and we did it blindly, and I graded a five, you did 5.5, they take the, um, the average of our scores, and that's what the student would get. So that's what they do here. I'm not sure how many graders grade on the analytical writing. I would hope three, but yes? So there's, so essentially there's four different types. There's the four, two that uh, quantitative, and two. You have two. basically two in each area. It's okay. six mini exams that rate between three, 30 minutes and 35 minutes. So we'll essentially get four scores. Yeah, no, you'll get, you should just get three scores. You should okay, just get so the verbal, the, the quantitative, and the analytical. So you'll know your first two scores, the verbal and the quantitative. You won't know analytical writing because that's, again, created computerized wise. They could probably feed it in um, and look for um, certain words, um, certain sentence structures. I'm sure that there are computers out there that grade all of that, but there's still the qualitative part that puts all that together but they could probably rank it through word usage and things like that that would give you a random score. And I don't know, maybe they take the computerized score and they take the rater score and those get meshed together somehow in some type of, I'm not sure how it works. That's what I think happens actually, but yes. Um, yeah, speaking of a follow-up on our yeah, yeah. comment, could you please talk a little bit about you know, some of the criteria that they grade based on, the analytical writing? It's going, um, there's a whole listing. In fact, I listed it here on the analytical writing skills. There is a little bit of a link and it talks about kind of like if you were going to, um, so that 30 minute, um, analyze, there's analyze an issue and then there's going to be analyze an argument. So analysis is one of the higher forms of the thought process that allows you to have to know both content areas and then analyze what is going on. So um, this is, these are various scenarios or instructions you might actually see and they give you several prompts. One, two, three, four, five, six potential prompts. So this is kind of nice. It says um, that you have to explain your agree uh, level of agreement or disagreement. The one thing I do know is that great, you're going to get higher points when you use higher vocabulary. Um, the one thing a computer can't check is the structure of your assessment, not the grammar as much as your comma usage, semicolons, those types of things. So I'm pretty sure that complex sentence structure would be one thing they would grade on, vocabulary usage, and then your essential idea of how do you frame an argument. That's essentially what you're doing with you when you analyze. You're kind of framing an argument. You're saying, I see both sides, and you're going to look at both sides and then, and then be able to do an analysis on what you believe. So I would come up with some type of background on how to frame an argument and the value of, of analysis. I'm just going to go back to probably the scientific realm, um, not as aligned with your own reflection and insight as far as taking multiple inputs and putting those together to make a drawn analysis. Kind of like when somebody says, well, can you write a little bit about how that, you know, if you had to read something from a chapter in a, in, a, in a book, in a textbook, and you had to do an analysis, you have to really know both sides to be able to analyze. And I think talking about both of those sides and then writing the analysis is important too. Not just saying, this is my viewpoint, this is what I believe based on this, this, and this. I think presenting both sides of an argument is a little bit deeper of an analysis than just saying, this is what I believe. Probably showing a little bit more roundedness. Again, those aren't things that computers can grade for. So they would grade for word usage, um, things that you can quantify through a computer and then you would have the rater who's going to qualify that. And from what I was reading, it looks like those two things somehow get averaged out, and that's where that analytical skills part comes in. Also, it's both actual you know, readers and, and, and mm -hmm. Yeah, there's actually humans that grade that second part. That's what I thought, yeah. But you're saying there's a, you know, kind of basic whatever. I'm, yeah, from what I... Done by the machine. Yes, from what I understand, there's going to be a basic computer output that comes. Again, those are things that you can quantify. And I'm sure that they've come up with this very finagle 
um, equation that they put in the numerical, they put in the quantitative based on some rubric, and those two scores get together and they shoot out your analytical skills. Um, as far as the mechanics of that, I don't know what it is, but I'm sure that it's out there if you Google it. Like, how do they quantify analytical skills on the GRE? You can probably Google it, yes. So when I go watch the test, I'm sitting, I finally get past everything, I'm sitting down on the computer. Is it going to be set up where I have 30 minutes of one type of test, 10 minute break, then go back for the rest of the, the other 30 minutes for the same test? For the analytical? Well, for any, like, any three parts of the test. Like how, I understand the, the three parts of them, I just don't understand how it's going to set, like when I'm sitting down on the computer, which one I'm going to get first, or which, how it's going to be set up, I guess? Um, the way that I was explaining, maybe you could answer, it went from verbal to quantitative to analytical. So we do the, the first 30 minutes. Well, the 30, 30, 35, 35, oh, so 30, 30. Like mm -hmm. And then when are the breaks? The breaks are between the two quantitative, the last time I took it. Okay. I don't think I got up to take the break, though, which was really stupid. I just tried to push through. And it should, they say on average, four to four and a half hours. And if I would have taken the break, I probably would have been there. I was like, I just want to get this over with. Do you remember? It was not a good. It was not a good rule of thumb. Take the thirty-minute break. Your brought your body and your brain needs a break. So. I mean, I took mine on the say what about five months ago now, and it's like I remember the breaks and everything, but I don't. Yeah, you just get up when you when you're supposed to. Right. Yeah. And they'll will they let you know. Okay, yeah. Well, the computer will stop and it'll say. Yeah, it literally will say you have now a ten-minute break. Come back and. Yeah, and there's time you check out and you check back in there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah don't take a smoke break and then like, hey, I'm in nine minutes late. Um, no, you don't get to leave. There's just, it's just stuck in an area. But the other thing you should be prepared for is that not everybody that's in there is taking the same exam as you are. There's people in all these exam carols taking ACT, SAT, GMAT, DAT, all of these different exams. So you need to be prepared. If you're the person who sits in a class like this and the minute that somebody walks by, you go like this. I call it small town syndrome. When someone walks in a cafe, you look the whole time. That's me. So I have to tell myself, concentrate. Breathing techniques work really well for me just to really zone in. Um, that type of thing. You have to be prepared for that environment because it isn't going to be, if you study in an environment that's at home where it's quiet and you take these practice exams, I say go to the library and take a practice exam. Even if it's a carol away where you hear doors slamming and you maybe hear people talking, because that is a very real scenario. I think that's probably um, a smart thing. So you can see some of these things, but basically it says to develop and support your position and address both viewpoints. So what they're doing is they're basically taking debate. They're basically, in analysis, they're asking you to debate, to debate something. They're saying, show me both viewpoints and then take a stance and, and qualify why you feel that way. So of going back to why you have why you have those underpinnings but you need to base it on something that's grounded you can't just say well i think that hopefully you have enough of a knowledge base that you can frame a question at least know a little bit about this and a little bit about this it's like the pro and the con you choose the con why did you choose it and then how do you validate that and usually three points are the way to do it three really solid points a good way to go through that. And support your support opinion. whatever side you okay. want through at least three points. But a lot of people say, let's say theoretically it's on, I don't know, standardized testing. And I say, well, I'm not really for it. Okay, great. Well, why why would people be in favor of standardized testing? Why would people not be? Just as a general statement. Then you say, however, I believe that, and then you list why you think they're cons. And can you provide an alternative? That's even more forward thinking. Like, well, if you say you don't care for them, what's the alternative? Maybe we keep standardized testing, but we have multiple forms of testing, or we look at multiple inputs, which is what I'm a fan of. I'm not saying I don't believe in standardized testing. I do believe that there's reasons we have them. I completely agree with that. But I, other thing, I also believe that if you're gonna quantify them this big, that everything else should be quantified just that big, which is your commitment to community, your volunteerism, your GPA, things like that. Those are very important. They say a lot about you with your stick to itiveness, your ability to extend yourself, and they're 21st century learning skills. I mean, a lot of people are very intelligent, but they can't relate to other people. How do we measure soft skills? Standardized tests don't do that in interview window. So maybe an interview component. And a lot of schools now, a lot of the Ivy League, Ivy, Ivy League schools you've seen in the media, they're dropping ACT and SATs. They want to see the higher GRA, the higher GPAs, the volunteerism, and they want some type of video component that is an interview. And that is huge because you can assess so much about an individual 
based on an interview. And I know that you can because I have viewed just in the last week 28 undergraduate interviews of people who want to be in the College of Education. And you can see right away the people that have it or the people that need to develop those dispositions. And so I'm not saying I don't believe in standardized. I just think that if you're going to have it, you need to quantify it with just as many majors across the field, um, whatever they happen to be. Because I do believe in um, like e and EQ, which is an emotional intelligence. I do so believe that exists. Uh, like oh my gosh, yeah, I know. Um, I watch um, every semester, I watch two to three minute videos. Um, and uh, once a month, I watch on average of about 28 to 50, and that goes even in the summer. I'll be watching eight to 10 videos while I'm teaching summer classes or in Belize or whatever. Yeah, and it goes on all year long because we don't have a cutoff. Um, you'd have to have multiple people measuring <coughs> that, and it has to be, it can't just be one person. It has to be multiple inputs on the interview too. So yeah, it's just kind of almost like the, the analyzing part of, of your writing. It can't just be one person. You have to have multiple raters, but you also have to have a, a sense of guideline as well. And so rubrics are very helpful in, in this. But yeah, it's very time consuming. It's easier just to give a test, just slap somebody down in front of a computer, and then tell you that the number that spits out quantifies their intelligence or um, how successful they will be. And by that way, that's, if you go do the research, it's blown out of the water that GRE does not predict your success rate in grad school, and I am a product of that because I'm not a test taker. So I will tell you that. My GRE score was not great. Not in the least, but I'd already been in grad school for two years. I'd already been a GRA and a GTA for two years, So, um, and I'd been out of college. I'd been out of college. I was a non-traditional student going back. I hadn't taken an algebra or a mathematics calc class at at least 10 years. So, yeah. I don't think there's any no, there's not, but you would think that numerically you'd be ahead by taking some advanced math. No, not at all. No, it is just basic ninth grade math. But that's another thing is you wonder what standards they're aligning to because a lot of the students right now, like uh, if you go take um, the ACT, SAT, a lot of those are becoming more common core based math. Well, if you were if you were in that slump where you left high school and you didn't get the common core based math and you're being assessed on a type of math, which is common core, it's really hard to be successful. Um, I didn't find any um, any basis in that, but that's kind of something that's going on in the U.S. right now as far as generalized testing. This is just basic algebra, geometry, analytics. Basic, I say. Yes. What did this for? Um, I can tell you it's not like 120 and 130 because I think mine was like right on the cusp. I think mine was like 121 and 130 is is looking at the upper, you know, upper range, they're looking for 130 to 170 total and as far as the score, and then they quantify all of that when they stick it all together. Some schools will say your entire GRE, they want a number of 700 and over. Um, I cannot remember what KU's was. 700. Um, they put all the scores together. It's like, a, it's like they put all those raw scores together and they generate a, a number with an equation, but 700 is the outcome or the what they want. Has anybody checked recently what a lot of schools are qualifying? Sometimes 550, 550 to 600 are a lot of them. It varies from program to program. And that's a really good point is that um, when you do take the GRE, you may be taking it as an undergrad to get into grad school depending on what program you're interested in. So a lot of the sciences want your GRE right off the bat. Um, soft sciences, not as much, hard sciences, and then if you go into humanities, they really don't need your GRE score until you're into your PhD program. So it just depends. That's why I'm saying, why would you need to take this? It just depends on what you want to do with it. Truly. Um, quickly, I think there's a couple other things I wanted to make sure I touched on. Okay, this is something I know I teach educational psychology and an assessment class. And these are things I know that are important, and I'm sure you all know that are important. One of the things I'm going to preach to you, but probably not follow myself, is this idea that you need to get plenty of rest while you're going through this process. Not just a week up into the process of actually taking it, but keep a really good balanced schedule. One of the things we know is that exercise is not only good for our body, it's really good for our brain. It gets the blood flowing, it actually helps synapses occur in the brain, it gets blood flowing, and you actually have a healthier brain when you exercise. Science proves that um, even just a 30-minute walk is better than just sitting in a library all day. 
So they talk about the importance and the value of exercising. They talk about the importance and the value of maintaining a regular schedule. I happen to be you stay up until midnight, 1, 2, and then you still get up at a regular time, like 7 a.m. So every night you're getting four or five hours of sleep. After a while, nobody can stand you on Friday because you're such a grouch. On, also, on Thursday and Friday, you can't remember anything. Your brain doesn't work very well. Your ability to answer questions, you just have no, your, your filing cabinet is then it's becoming a more and more narrow opening the time, more tired you get. You can't fully open that up unless you're getting good quality sleep, a good seven to eight hours. Do this up to several, several weeks. Even when you're taking the practice exams, you need to simulate everything biologically, psychologically, that you're going to do when you want to take this assessment. So when you do take the assessment, go take it in a place like a public library or a foresight. Um, take it at home when you know it may be, people may be in and out. Uh, make sure you are taking care of your body. Make sure you're staying healthy. All these things really do change the psychology of being a good test taker. If you don't feel good, if you're nervous, if you're upset, if something's going on in your world that's not normal, that's going to affect your test. Don't go in and take your test if you just broke up with your boyfriend last night. Don't do it. All those things affect you, okay? Just don't do it. Think about how important rest is. The brain just doesn't work when your body isn't rested and your brain is rested. It's so important. Your memory stems so much more, much out of your body being rested. Um, I can tell you the days I come to work and I have not had enough sleep, I just can hardly recall anything. And I don't think it's aging brain as much as it is the, the inability to go to bed at night, okay? Everybody kind of knows, okay, so the one thing I have driven home is I don't care what type of learner you are. Fundamentally, you can't study this way and probably go take the computerist exam and be as successful. You have to practice in the same manner in which you're going to take the exam. That's fundamentals of just how our brains work, okay? Secondarily, know what your strengths or weaknesses. If you know you're a great writer, if you know you can argue to the depth, then you probably don't need to go practice your analytical writing skills as much. I'm not saying, hey, I'm great at that. Or, she said, don't even look at it. It's not what I'm saying. That would be silly. What I'm saying is if you know that you struggle in math, and I struggled in math pretty much high school uh, until I got to college and started taking calc, and I had an amazing uh, instructor. That's a long time to really hate math, to just have something that actually is really amazing and beautiful after it's a puzzle that you put together. Um, so if you know that's where you're gonna struggle, you have to concentrate on that area, even if you hate it the most. It's just like anything in life, if we can do the things we hate right now and just get them over with, we don't have to go back and keep thinking about this stuff. We can just get it over with. And realize that this study, the stuff, the time you're putting in, all the time and energy doesn't last forever, and you have to look at it like that. And also reward yourself as you go through this process. As you go through the study process and doing this, and, it's, and you're, you know, you're gonna use this 30 to 60 days to study, whatever your time frame is. Set a time frame, say every day I'm gonna spend this amount of time, and stick to it. It's like a job. You have to stick to it, you have to do it. Even the times you don't want to, okay? The one thing I like about that is the idea of using apps. And so the app that I found was, um, this guy actually has a website, Magoosh. Is that the one you used? Magoosh? It's the one that I read about a lot. It just happened to pop up when I looked at tips, tricks, insights, research. Um, Magoosh was the one, and if you look on, um, if you look on iTunes, it's highly rated. It's a highly rated app. I don't remember, I'm gonna look it up real quick. So I'm a big rating person, so if I'm gonna go stay at a hotel or a rental, you know, rent a place for a week or whatever, I always look at TripAdvisor and then I look at Expedia and then I like mingle this together with VRBO and look to see what people said. And if everybody rated it a four or five, then it'll probably work out pretty good. We won't have bed bugs. So let me see. I think I actually only put in GRE vocabulary. Magoosh has a bunch of different ones though. It's not just this, the only one that I just looked up. Uh, vocabulary, five stars, 186 raters. So that's not a huge amount of rating, but it's good for, uh, it's, that's a good rating for, um, for uh, any of the iTunes or the apps. Yeah, they have a nice little sample amalgam. If you think about um, an amalgam goes in your mouth, has anybody ever seen a mix, an amalgam that goes in your mouth? It's a mixture of different substances that gets tamped down into the hole that fills a filling. So it's multiple things, like kind of like a concrete and a metal and all these things being mixed together. An amalgam is what goes in your mouth to make a filling. So the word amalgam, that's where this comes from. 
multiple things being blended together. That's how you remember context of words. Put it into some reference you know. Okay, that was another tip that I had. How do we boost our vocabulary? This was a really good thing. If you're a, how many of you would consider yourself to be a visual learning, and when I say a visual, you're the kind of person who reads a book and then you see in the bottom right hand corner, you have the highlighted word, the highlighted word, and the minute you know you need to find that reference, it was in the bottom right hand corner of the book. That's the way I learn, that's the way I remember things. So um, those references are important, but so are the visual references. So to me, the word amalgam becomes an action as well as something that I'm also hearing and seeing. The more references you can add to that, the better. To put that into context, how many people in middle school or high school had a teacher that you sang a song about the presidents, you sang a song about um, the Constitution, you sang a song about pronouns and um, adjectives called the Shirley Method? Most of those people that I have at Ed site that took that class in seventh or eighth grade, these are people that are 21 or 22, they can still sing the same song that they learned in seventh and eighth grade in Hayes Middle School about the president, and they can sing all of those. It's because you use multiple modalities to get it into your brain. And we know higher on the scale, the more you have multiple inputs, the more you're going to remember. Okay, so if you just read it, that's really at the bottom of the level. If you read it, if you clap it, sing it, if you make a song to it, you're going to remember it. Because we're using multiple modalities to get it in the brain and we can recall it easier. So when these words come up, there's multiple tips. Um, I'm, not a, I'm not a number one fan because it doesn't last. So if you've done something and you took an assessment and you're like, yeah, I nailed it, but I memorized everything. If I asked you to take that same assessment, most of you wouldn't score the same proficiency as you did the first time because all you did was memorize it long enough to take the exam, so that's just rote memorization. Or like they say, brute force. I mean, that even sounds harsh, so I, I would not say do that, unless you're like in panic mode, but I hope you plan this out um, to where you're not cramming the day before. If you're cramming the day before, you probably waited too long to study, okay? Create um, associations between words, that's what I did with the word amalgam. Create word to picture association, that was amalgam. I made flashcards that helped me a little bit because it made me write them out. Don't type them up unless that's the type of memory you have. If you have more of a memory with a pencil and a paper, write them out. Some of us have better memory by typing. I'm the kind of person who can't edit worth a crap when I'm typing. I have to physically print it out. My entire dissertation I printed out multiple times and edited right off of paper and pencil. I could not edit on the screen. It's just not the way my brain works and that's why I had a problem going from that book to this screen and being successful. Some of us don't know that about ourselves until we try it. So you've got to be willing to try different things. I'm the kind of person, if you look at any textbook I teach from, it has tons of writing all over in it. There's scribbles, there's little notes. I'm a person who's tactile and I like to stick it on paper and write it. So if you're going to do the flashcard thing, great, but also mix it up with this then too. Use multiple modalities and see what's working. Go back and test yourself and see what stuck and what didn't. If you start realizing flashcards, even though they're a pain in the butt, you had to write all this out. I'm not saying write out 3,500 flashcards, but if you and another person are going to do it, maybe you could get a pile of people together, and if you, if you did it like 500, that wouldn't be so bad. You definitely are going to remember it. You're going to remember the 500 you wrote, but not the 500 he wrote for you. There's a value in writing stuff out, too. And if that's the way you've learned primarily, you have to think about these things. You have to know who you are. You have to use what's called metacognition, thinking about how you think. Think about how you think and what works best for you. We're not all built the same. We're not all made of the same wood. The way I study is completely different than you study. A lot of people can highlight and remember, that doesn't work for me. It's just, I just know it doesn't work. You have to know what kind of test taker you are. And this is this goes along the gamut with regard to all learning and even going into graduate type schools. Okay, so plan how and where and what you're gonna do to prepare. We talked about this multiple times. Give yourself plenty of times to prep um, I made the mistake that I think I gave myself about four weeks to prep for the GRE, and in that amount of time, I went on a ski trip to Breckenridge, and I thought I was going to study <laughs> while everybody was skiing. Yeah, I studied, but I was also like, hey, you get some chili, get some cinnamon rolls. It's definitely not a good testing um, prep situation. You really need to donate an hour of your time for 60 days versus three weekends where you just cram, and you're like, I hate this GRE stuff. I hate it. Okay? Plan it out an hour out of your day, every day. 
and just start with what you don't like. I hate to say it, but to get better at what you don't like, you've got to practice. You're never going to get it good at something you don't like unless you practice it and you have to force yourself to do it. Get a partner, a partner, an accountability partner that, that helps you study. You say, hey, every night at the library, let's meet for two hours. Let's study. We're going we're gonna to do the analytical writing part. We're going to grade one another. And you will write each other. And you'll write that out. And you'll say, well, did you think about this? It's called constructive, um, basically, type response. And constructivism is how we learn from one another. There's a lot of value in learning from one another. And people see things differently than you do. Okay, You could be the raider for them. So consider doing things like that. Get an accountability partner. They're going to make you sure you show up and actually do what you said you were going to do. It's easy to skip out. Um, plenty of rest, definitely, definitely important. Don't cram. If you're still studying the day before, that means you crammed and you just think you're just going to magically pull it out. It's not going to happen. Osmosis doesn't occur in those small amounts of time. It's not going to seep in your brain overnight. And you're going to be more stressed because you really didn't prepare. And that's going to be in the back of your brain. When you get to the question, you're like, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, I didn't prepare all going to build up. So the more you prepare, the more you know about the content, the more you do a little bit of research. Just research the ETS site. There's a ton of value. They basically tell you exactly what to expect. So research just the, G, the, the GRE ETS website. They give you so much information. And then they also give you a free download. Okay, And then practice. You have to know that the content is something I know that most of you know. You could go in and ace it, especially if we were verbally talking about it. It's the actual exam part. Being a good question uh, answer takes knowing how to answer the question by reading it really well. Okay, Taking time. Knowing what kind of questions you stumble on and which ones you're really good at. Okay, um, Where did I want to go on that ETS site real quickly? I think there's something I wanted to show you. I don't know what it is, but I wanted to show you. Let's just go to the GR. Okay. Um, where did I, I downloaded this and went through it. Maybe it was the official test prep. There's a full download here. Yeah, this is it, I think. Yeah. Okay, so it was in a couple clicks. So I got to the, the just the ETS GRE site, and I went to over here to official test prep. And the thing that they're actually using is called Power Prep. It's so powerful. It's a funny name. Okay, so then you can get a download, PC or Mac version. I just put it out on my desktop and started going through it. Gives you, again, it's going to recap the same stuff we talked about today. These people don't want you to get by them. They want you to know what to expect um, with regard to what's on here and how to get familiar with it. Um, and then there's two actual practice exams. I would not put it past you to do two things. If, you, if you're if you anywhere near or can take at least, the, let's just say that you realize quantitatively this is difficult for you and you're just not a math person, go take the math prep for the GRE. Go take just a section. You don't have to take the whole thing. Just take a prep course for the GRE, just the mathematical section. If you know that's, it'll, it'll boost you boost your confidence and self-esteem that you had someone else's help. It wasn't just on you, so that's helpful. And then take these practice exams. First of all, take the first one in any setting you like. Take a second and a third. I would at least probably take three. And I know that's not, not that some fun. That's like at least 12 hours, and that's prepping before you even take them. But the more you practice, I think fundamentally what they're saying is the research is that's how you get better, is the practicing part. And I don't know where that's not true in almost anything unless you're naturally gifted at taking the GRE. So if you're naturally gifted, you don't even need to come to this session. But I fear that most of us aren't um, naturally gifted when it comes to new assessments. And if you haven't been put in this position before, it's probably a little bit difficult and a little bit stressful. So the more you can do to prep, the better it will be in the long run. I do know this. I do this. So. Any other questions that you can think of? Or what app did you have that you maybe found helpful? I actually just looked that up. I think it was the same one. Okay. Um, like if you one. go to any of the Magoosh ones, um, here's their website. And uh, I read a bunch of um, input from people who would use this and where they said, hey, I was really proficient at this, but not so great at this. This is what I used for, and it really helped. There was several um, practical pieces of feedback on here. 
um, I think this is probably a great place to start. Um, if you're a person who likes to use technology, and you have, you know, even between classes, you go grab a coffee, you have 10, 15 minutes to be jamming some vocabulary in your head. If you realize you go through and you start seeing the same words and they're still not making sense, then this app doesn't work for you and you need to go with flashcards. You need to be smart enough to realize that just because you're using this tool doesn't mean it's going to your brain. You need to be assessing that through metacognition. Is this really working for me? Is this how I really think or learn? If you're using this app, doesn't mean you're magically gonna like ace the vocabulary section. You've gotta figure out what works for you. So it may be the written part, which sounds horrendous, but that's just, I remember rewriting and rewriting. This book has had a list. It's, um, is it called Gordon's or Barron's? Or I don't know why I'm making that reference. It's like Barron's list of vocabulary or Gordon's list of vocabulary. Um, that's where the, that's the, the origin of those 3,500 words. <coughs> If you would put GRE vocabulary, they'll tell you what the basis, and I want to say it's like Barron's vocabulary. Definitely something. Okay, here's a nice thing. Do you have this book? Okay, so page eight. Here's that where it tells you how, what to expect as far as timing. Again, this as well as the website, they really are kind of like the, the recipe for how to do well. Make the cookie, otherwise, cookie is probably not going to have the ingredients that you need. I mean, a lot of times, being good on assessment is reading the assessment entirely through and then taking it, and that's kind of what they're wanting you to do. Is they don't put the first eight pages in the book for you to just say, "Hey, those were really great." Someone else can read that crap, not me. There's reliability in reading what to expect. Again, psychologically, it just helps you to be a better test. Those are all very, very proven facts. So again, look at this book um, and don't just depend on that as your method and mode to do it. Take it, take it all the time. People are um, wanting to take the GRE and what are you planning on doing just for, just for my own, what are you, what you want to do? Speech and English pathology. Okay. The master's level yeah. entrance. Okay. And what are you wanting to take? Sometimes before school's end. Yeah. Okay. Then you've started early enough. Yeah. I've actually got a lot of weeks out. Okay. I'm thinking, I'm not thinking, I'm for sure getting into the clinical psychology program. Okay. So. Use the power of positive language. When I get in, it really does work. That's how my ex husband got into dental school. It was 37 when he went to dental school, and he always said, When I get into dental school, you got in. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, he did. In fact, he met with people that he knew were going to be on the review committee because they had interview. You had to take um, the DAT, which at that, fine, at that time the DAT entrance exam was 18 was the minimum. Um, most people entered, um, unless you were a six year. UMKC used to have a program that allowed six years. That means you'd gone to four years of high school and you finished your undergrad in two years, so you were called a sixth year. So you were fundamentally about um, 20, 21 going to dental school. And here's my assessment, 37, so it's like the grandfather. Um, definitely some interesting skill sets there, 22 years old going into dental school versus a, most people on average are in their um, mid to late 20s. A little bit of frontal lobe development that hasn't happened. So it's like he keep going to school with teenagers, going to dental school with teenagers. Um, but he used positive language. He never said, if I get in, he always said, when I get in. And he always spoke like that when he talked to admissions people. One of the people he fundamentally knew was on that committee. He always used positive, like, positive language. And yeah, he's been a dentist since he graduated right before he was 40. So it's another story of how it's really never too late to try something new or do something different. So um, he's been a dentist for about uh, nine years now um, here in Hayes, America. What do you want to do? Okay. I plan on taking it again about school, but I haven't really been quite there yet. Okay. I'm going to start studying on the weekend. Okay. Are you a good test taker? Usually. Um, we've got a game and a half hours long. Mm -hmm. So we'll look at breaks. So Maybe like margarita night after that. That's all I can say. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, hope, I hope this is going to be a little bit easier, but uh, then again, like, I hate it. So yeah. And you go in with that calm, oh, no, I think I'll do pretty good. You're like, oh, crap. Right. Yeah, you hate to over, you don't ever want to um, underestimate 
always go in that this is that this is going to suck and that I need to study, and then you'll just be farther ahead if you if you really didn't study hard. So, yeah, if you commit weekends, you should be in pretty good shape as long as you have a good schedule. And if you want to start digging away, yeah, vocabulary is one of those things that most of us stumble on. We tend to be a society that doesn't use too many words. We use we know a lot of words, and we can rationalize those words. If you spoke a high level, I can put enough together to understand what you're saying, but I wouldn't be able to use those words myself. That's what we know. Yeah. We definitely know that. It's, it starts at the age, it's time toddlers. Toddlers can identify up to 10,000 words, but they only use three or four hundred. What do you want to do? I'm going to take my GRE in early December. I think. Okay. Yeah. Good, good. And what do you want to do with it? Um, I wish to go to the doctoral program in KU. Okay. Communication studies. Okay, good. Yeah. yeah. And actually, I'm uh, remembering the vocabulary, and I need to read them and uh, try to find the because I need to learn the Chinese and meaning and and then translate. Yeah, yes. it's a lot of. It's really difficult. In fact, uh, the section we're studying in EdSec right now is about English language learners. Mm -hmm. And even though we're speaking English, there's a different type of English, and it's called academic English. Yeah. And it's the same thing you're talking about in that mm -hmm. um, we assume because we both speak English that we speak academic English. So academic English would be like um, find the binary whatever of this, and I know what I'm talking about. You know what we're talking about. But because it's an academic language we speak in English, it may not translate to Spanish or Chinese or whatever. So yeah, it's, it's very interesting. It's very, I, I, that's a, that's difficult, I know, that's what difficult, so good for you. And what do you want to do? Just come to my wife. Uh, so you're supporting her? And you're, are you gonna take the GRE too? No. Oh, come on. What are you, what are you, what are you doing or what are you working on? Uh, actually, I'm doing my master's. Good, what are you getting your master's in? Well, what are you doing your master's in? Major? Yeah, what's your major? MIS. Okay. Medicine Good. And so when she's going to school, you're going to support her and get a job? <laughs> yes. Actually, MIS is a good thing to be in, especially um, a lot of like network, um, network administration as well as a lot of network security. That I, yeah. Network security is hiring big in the Kansas City area. I know they're breaking down people's doors that aren't even finished with their programs for network security. And a lot of it you can do at home. It's kind of cool. Yes. Okay, and what do you want to do? Keep up with the kinesiology part. Yeah. Okay. Sports management. Yeah. Very good. And where are you wanting to get into? There are, you know, it's a, about 10 programs that I'm looking at. He is one of them. Yeah, yeah, they have a great program. They do, they do, yeah. Um, it, the problem is, like, it's the, you know, I'm trying to go on the GA positions, and it's like, I don't see a lot of correlation between, you know, Joe's and Wilson. Um, I actually didn't get my GTA or GRE position until I'd been there and met someone. Yeah. And that's how it's actually most jobs I've ever gotten in my life, even this position at Fort Hayes. Um, it's not what I knew, it was who I knew. And I didn't get my GRE position until about six weeks into the semester. I went I went from being a full time teacher with benefits to a grad student with no benefits. <laughs> And so, yeah, within a few weeks, I, I found out that someone in my department needed a GRA, and so I just became a research mm -hmm. geek. And that next semester, it happened to be that the person, it's, it's fundamentally huge on big campuses like D1 institutions, research institutions, they train their GRAs and their GTAs. The person whose position I took, she didn't go to the one-day training that was mandatory. Yeah. So I was able to slide in her position. I taught for seven semesters in undergrad at KU. And um, I did, it was nothing that I knew. It, has, it was not based on an assessment of the GPA or classes I was taking. It literally was, I knew the person, I expressed interest to him and said, hey, I'd really love to teach classes, even if it's with you, even if it's just shadowing you, and all of a sudden, you can move into those types of things. No, you're right, though. you got to this out there for sure. So you just them. might you might have to get in there, get in a program, and it may not be the first semester. You may be in a lot of thumb twiddling. Might a lot, you may be really dedicated to your work at that time. Um, but then taking those GTA and GR positions, they help you, um, first of all, get into this culture of a school that you're not from. When, you, when you've been in an institution and you go there as a grad student, it's different than going as an undergrad. Because yeah. um, you're an adult, you're non-traditional. Um, a lot of people are going to work in your discipline. They're going to have day jobs and they're going to be coming to a PhD program at night. And so they're going to have full-time jobs and here you are a full-time student. 
And so it's hard to get to know people. So when you get to know students, it gives you that connection to the campus. It gives you a little bit of a, a sense of belonging, I think. Um, the other thing is it hones in on your skills of relating to others and can you teach can you teach what you know? Because I think that's one of the greatest forms of knowledge level is you know it, but if you can really be efficient and proficient in teaching, that means you've really learned you've really learned your stuff. That's one thing, yeah. I'm, I'm glad you said this one because that's just thinking about all of them. I mean, aren't they supposed to look at, you know, you read your resume, your you know, mm -hmm. your experience and whatnot. But yeah. Yeah, I know someone that's doing their master's in, um, it's actually in the education department, yeah. but it is a sports psychology. Okay. And it's actually housed under education, which makes sense, sense because it's all developmentally based. Right. And so, yeah, and he's doing research at KU on the Lawrence High School baseball team and doing, using them as the, as the fundamental basis for their sports psychology research. Very cool, very cool. A lot of stuff goes into that. Shaylin, you're just a sophomore, but what do you want to do? Um. I, um, my undergrad degree will be in history education, probably with a minor in English, and so if I plan to teach directly after school, then I will go and I'll probably get my master's, um, probably either in history or English, but I might also have to take the GRE if I decide to go to law school. That sounds great. Yeah, the history curriculum is huge. Mm -hmm. I advise for history. You can take it as a form, but if it's accepted, otherwise you have to take whatever the whatever the entrance exam is to law school. It's, I think it's like the L LSAT, LSAT or something. LSAT, MCAT, DAT, all those. Yeah, each of them has their fundamental because it's it's basic knowledge like we're talking about, but then they go into content knowledge or content based depending on what you're geared towards. So basically, what we're talking. It's like a subject GRE. It is. It's like a subject matter GRE. It's basically what teachers take before they go and get their licensure. So you get a K through six assessment for generalized education, and you would take like a history or a art or a music. So if you have any questions, um, you are welcome to stop by my office. I am in Rarick 210. I have been a professional student for a very long time. Um, I went, I actually got two degrees at Fort Hayes, and I taught high school, and then I got my master's at KU. And I was a GRA and a GTA at KU, and then I taught for seven semesters in my master's and PhD coursework at KU, and then graduated. So I went straight from my master's right into my PhD program because I knew I was going to be moving back to Hayes, and I only had four years to complete that. Um, another thing you can think about is that you sometimes don't have to be present to complete your PhD where you want to. So I did all my coursework at KU, and then I moved back to Hayes and I did my research here, I did my orals and writtens here. Just depends on your program and what type of research you're doing, whether it's individualized or group, but um, it does make you movable. Your PhD makes you that ability. Now, if you're going into a program that's like dental school or, or um, law school or medical school, you're grounded to dust. You're grounded to that school for a while, for quite a while. So just think about those things. But, um, and my ex-husband went through dental school at UMKC, so I'm used to that. And we've all been to institutions. I've been to KU, he's been to K-State, and he's been to UMKC. And we've both been to Fort Hayes. He actually got all of his trained descent for the DAT here at Fort Hayes. He said fundamentally the best school he's been to for sciences. He did the advanced A&P with the cadavers here. He did all the chemistry courses here to set for the DAT, and he said it was he had a much better education than that at K-State there's one-on-one -on -one interaction. People truly care about you as an individual. That's the difference. So, he still talks about all those people over in the sciences. So, anyway, I hope in some way it's helped you. All I know is that having taught people um, all the way from ninth graders to grad students, I will tell you it's not your ability to remember the content, and it's usually not the content that will trip you up. It's the, it's the, it's the sciences of the actual assessment. It's taking your time, it's preparing, and it's being psychologically prepared. It's having the practices, studying, um, having accountability partners, getting plenty of rest, taking care of your body, because your brain can't work if your body isn't functioning. Okay? It just doesn't happen. If you're doing kind of meditation, meditation, you just know they're all linked together, and it's not going to work unless everything's functioning together. And sleep is really important for memory. Just try not sleeping and then going and taking a test the next day. Your success rate will be in the toilet unless you like have the answers right. Um, 
Okay, so if you need any guidance, help, insider tips, whatever, I'm not sure I know the answers, but I can help you find them. Maybe, maybe I've experienced them. All I know is even at this level with a PhD on tenure track, you're still jumping through hoops. And you're gonna say, why do I need to take this? It's called hoop jumping. Because the people before you had to do it, the people before you had to do it, and it's just, this is how it goes. I don't know if you ever end up getting out of the hoop or stop hoop jumping, but I say that about the tenure track. Why am I have to do this tenure notebook? I have a PhD, I've written a dissertation. Nah, it doesn't matter. It's like a rite of passage. And it's also the, the biggest word for formality. It's just formality. It's just what you do. All to the tune of one hundred and ninety-five dollars. So, um, yeah. So don't take it again. Don't take it again. <laughs> so if you need anything, you are welcome to contact me. I'm in teacher education. I'm in Rarity Hall two ten, and I'm pretty much here all the time. <laughs>